Hey folks, Dr. Mike Israel here for Renaissance Periodization, RP University, RP Plus, the last eighth lecture of Nutrition for Muscle Gain, Myths and Misconceptions, and Special Circumstances in the Quest for Muscle Gain. Let's get into it. Special Circumstances are up first. Here's the deal. If you are an athlete and you want to gain mass in sport seasons, right? in the context of sport, let's talk about when is good and when is bad. Right? When you're in season for a sport, the vast majority of your training volume is going to be sport-specific. Sport-specific training volume means it makes you good at your sport, but is not idealized to put on muscle. Hypertrophy training is. And in season, you're probably doing the least hypertrophy training you do all year and the least weight training probably, and you play the most of your sport. Gaining mass during season is for that reason not a great idea. Off season is a good time to gain mass as long as you have enough time to gain the weight, stabilize your performance, potentially cut some fat maybe, uh, and then enter the season. So I sure as heck wouldn't recommend a mass gain four weeks before a season, but 16 weeks before a season, you can go on a 12-week mass gain for four weeks after, kind of just res resume your more athletic endeavors, lower your training volume, let that muscle sort of uh, be a little bit more ingrained into the performance side of things, and then go on and go forward. So the real thing about sports seasons, in season, not a good time to gain mass. I've unfortunately been involved in collegiate athletics a long time, and I've seen this happen. Coaches will say, you know, such and such basketball player needs to gain weight, and they're going to be eating a ton of food um, in season. It's like, man, you know, they're going to gain weight in season. First of all, it's hard because they're playing so much and practicing so much. But second of all, if they do gain weight, because the weight training volume is usually maintenance at most, um, they're just going to gain like probably fat, and then it's just going to slow down. Remember, when coaches say athletes need to gain weight, they almost always mean muscle. That's going to take months of really good resistance training, hypertrophy, rep ranges, and volumes, and that's really gonna, only going to happen in the offseason in a properly designed program. So that's the deal there. Now, let's talk about some substandard situations for muscle gain and maybe a couple of tips as to how to get the most out of them. I was going to say get around them, but there really is no getting around them. First up, uh, folks that can't eat remotely clean, right? They have access maybe to only very high fat or very unhealthy food. That's definitely a problem. The good news is, is here's how you navigate it. You eat as much carbohydrate and as little fat and eat as healthy as you can. And what you probably want to do to minimize fat gains is to just lower your rate of weight gain down to something a little bit more manageable so that if you do gain an excess amount of fat versus muscle, it's not an absolute number high amount of fat. Like if you were planning on getting five pounds of muscle and five pounds of fat and you end up gaining eight pounds of fat and two pounds of muscle because the food quality sucked... That's going to suck. Eight pounds of fat's a lot. But if you lower your weight gain to a total of six pounds, you might gain a pound of muscle and five pounds of fat. Well, the muscle gain pound sucks, but uh, at least you only gained you know, five pounds of fat, and that's pretty easy to get rid of, easier than eight, right? So if you can't eat remotely clean, don't just go throw calories. Remember, anytime you can, can't eat clean, you can still hit your calories, which is number one, and you can almost always get enough protein. After that, you really just... Uh, have the more minute problem of eating just not enough carbohydrates and too many fats, and also the quality of the nutrients, the food composition might be of uh, lower value. So uh, that's not a terrible problem. The worst thing to do in this can't eat remotely clean thing is to just be like, well, if I can't eat clean, I'm just going to eat everything I can, eat tons of pizza and fries and all this other stuff, and all of a sudden you balloon up to a really high body weight. That's not a really good idea, because what that's going to do is just gain you a ton of fat and probably not much more muscle. Next up, can't eat often. So you might be able to eat only three meals per day, right? First of all, unless you're a neurosurgeon or James Bond, you can almost always sneak food in. Two easy ways. Almost all jobs allow you a bathroom break. During a bathroom break, even if your boss says you can't eat or drink at work, if you're female, you have a purse, if you're male, eh, you're kind of fucked, but you might find a way around it. Bring a bar or two bars or a sandwich. Sandwiches don't hold really well, but bars definitely do. A shake into the bathroom, into the stall if you have to. Drink the shake or some muscle milks. 
or eat the bar or whatever. All right. I'm not familiar with almost any job in which people care if you if you poop twice a day. Right? It's not going to be like, why are we in the bathroom for five minutes? Uh, what the hell are we doing there that takes so long? I mean, maybe you're from the military, but then, you know, it's kind of like you can gain mass at another time. Um, and that's only just, you know, boot camp. Most active duty, you have much more freedom. So in, in most jobs, you know, you can disappear and go to the bathroom for five minutes at a time. Most, not all. And that means you can say you're pooping or, oh shit, if you're really a A-plus mass gainer, you can poop and eat at the same time. I've never done that myself many times. You got to do what it takes. So you can sneak food in uh, and, and and that can definitely be a thing. If you can't, here's the deal. Keep your calories, keep your macros, just split into the number of meals you can eat. And remember, you can always add some meals by eating in non-traditional times. People say, well, I can do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's three meals. Well, you can always do a late night snack. That's four. Four meals is like you're well within good range, right? Be creative. Don't break any outright rules. Try to make sure that it's an inconvenience to yourself, potentially. That might have to be the price. You still get enough food in. So, Do you want to drag in protein bars in your purse? No. Uh, are you going to do what it takes? Maybe. That's up to you. But remember, if it's just three meals a day or something like that, still try to meet your calories and macros. It's still possible. What about playing another sport on top of bodybuilding or on top of trying to gain muscle? Let's say you do Brazilian jiu-jitsu or wrestling or tennis or something like that. Um, that's definitely a thing. It is definitely a substandard situation. My recommendation would be choose a phase of training or intentionally make it so that you do as little of that sport as possible, as much weight training as possible, and dedicate your mass gaining there. Later on maintenance and on fat loss phases, you can definitely flip the script and do more of the sport, less resistant training, so on and so forth. But try to do it so that when you're playing the sport less, or when you're mass gaining, muscle gaining, you play the sport less, practice less, so on and so forth. It's 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 definitely tough. Don't have magical thinking and think you're going to be the greatest three-sport athlete of all time. You could be, but the greatest three-sport athlete at all time is not the greatest at any one of those sports by a long margin. So keep that in mind. You're going to have to pay the piper one way or another. Another one is poor sleep amounts. Sleep seems to be, with all available research so far, and there's getting to be a bit, um, incredibly, incredibly important to muscle gain and very important to fat loss. Chronically, especially missing sleep, seems like almost a formula for losing fat, or sorry, for losing muscle and gaining fat at the same time. It's like real bad. If you're not getting enough sleep, just try to do your best and maybe take some naps or something. If you're not satisfied with your fat gains slash muscle gain ratios after a month or two of massing, you might consider maintaining until your schedule improves. And if it's within your power to improve your schedule, improve your schedule. Poor sleep amounts are hugely detrimental. These other things, you can kind of work around them to some extent. Poor sleep, man, there's really no workaround. Uh, so we just want you to know that. Um, potentially some of you watching this are using this information for yourselves, you selfish bastards. Some of you are going to be helping others. Some of you are personal trainers or coaches. For those of you, but both for yourself and that are personal trainers and coaches, just kind of know that poor sleep amount, like I notice I didn't tell you a lot of workarounds because there are any. So why is this information valuable? Am I just telling you bad news as a joke? Well, no. Um, you're going to have clients that let's say, you know, you're a personal trainer in New York City and you got clients that are on Wall Street. And uh, through a variety of lifestyle choices slash their jobs, it's never just their jobs, they don't get much sleep. Uh, you know, they enjoy partying, they enjoy drinks with uh, friends, clients, whatever, and they enjoy traveling. And they also, you know, it's like a rock star Wall Street lifestyle, right? Uh, uh, Wolf of Wall Street type of shit. And that's totally cool. It's a great way to live. But some of them will come to you in personal training and say, listen, I'm dedicated. I train with you four days a week. I want you to help me with a diet. I want you to maintain uh, records and I want you to help me gain muscle. If uh, it becomes apparent to you upon discussing their lifestyle that uh, they don't get much sleep, this is like a come to Jesus meeting conversation you're going to have to have and say, look, we can give this like a college try and have you gain weight while not getting enough sleep, but I can reasonably assure you the results will not be, if you get good results, you could have gotten amazing results if you hadn't done the other way around. It's just, it's just a fact. 
So um, keep that in mind. It's something, it, it, what I want you guys to get out of this is not thinking like, well, so many of my Wall Street clients, they don't sleep a whole lot, but we're going to try to gain muscle mass because it's not like a huge deal. False. It's a huge deal. And they should know that. You don't want to like charge someone for six months of mass gaining programming and them end up gaining, barely gaining any muscle mass and just getting super fat. Whereas you could have just told them, look, just don't even start this mass gain unless you sort your sleep out. And they say, okay, great. I'm going to get so eight hours a night for the following six months. I'm not going to go to Ibiza. I'm not going to travel for a bit. Let's just get this muscle gain going. If they on board, if they know the plan, if they do it, they're going to get great results. They're going to recommend you to 10 other Wall Street guys, and then you'll be fucking loaded, right? Versus just ripping someone off and just being like, oh yeah, I guess you should have slept more. Like no in advance. It's your job to know in advance. It's not theirs because they don't know the stuff. They didn't go to school for it. Next one, very related, high stress. Right. It is possible to gain muscle on high stress more than low sleep, but it's really tough. So a lot of folks, again, you can sort of warn them in advance, you know, like try to stress as little as possible. I'll tell you this, um, a lot of people can uh, come to grips with the mechanical, sort of purely physiological limitations on muscle growth. Like they know they don't eat enough protein. You're like, you should eat more protein. They're like, I know, I know, makes sense. Or, you know, they'll catch themselves in the middle of the day not having eaten. They'll be like, I need to eat fucking mass gain. I need to eat. Or they're not going to get enough sleep and you're going to get more sleep. And they're like, yes, I know. And if they don't get enough sleep, they'll catch themselves and be like, sleep, 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 sleep. I got to get it. Stress is one of those things that people see as such a psychological thing. They just associate it entirely from having physiological effects on their bodies. Like you don't ever think like when you're yelling at a client and telling them these you know, Q3 figures look like shit. You don't think of that as literally hurting your muscle gains, but it literally is. So some people that just seem, you know, you have clients or sometimes yourself, you're super fucking wound up. They have like 800 responsibilities, 799 of which are purely voluntary. Um, and they're just sort of strung out in 50 different directions. Folks like that sometimes need some advice and being like, look, you got to cool the jets, uh, calm down a little bit and, and, and find ways to de-stress. And there's tons. We have the whole recovery book at RP, uh, if you're interested, um, and, and how to do that and different kinds of stress. Uh, that's definitely a thing that comes up because sometimes people are like, yeah, I'm getting enough sleep. And you're like... Okay, like what's the rest of your life like? And they're like, it's just go, 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 go all the time. And it's like, man, especially if you're emotionally stressed, remember emotional stress is fight or flight. It's sympathetic nervous system, boost in cortisol, uh, lowering of testosterone. Or, you know, it's not, that it doesn't take a fucking rocket scientist to figure out where that goes. Uh, and it's not in the direction of muscle gain. So high stress, definitely something to look out for. Um, here's a big one, injury that prevents hard training. Uh, people say like, hey, you know, like I can't, uh, my, I can't use my hips, but I want to gain a bunch of muscle. Or like, oh, geez, Christ, like can't do squats, can't do deadlifts, can't do leg press. Like, uh, man, we can't do bent rows. It's going to be tough. You have to give them a talk about like, well, listen, you know, maybe it's upper body only, then we have to gain really slow. Um, it's really tough in the, in the fat loss version of this lecture, which is a different lecture series. We're going to talk about people trying to lose fat when they're so injured that they can't train to keep their muscle on. This is the same idea. Like a prerequisite of gaining mass is the ability to train hard. Now, if you train hard by working around injuries, or if you don't have any major injuries, both are check marks, but you got to have at least one or the other. So if someone's like super injured and they're like, let's gain muscle, you got to give them the talk of like, look, to gain muscle, we have to move your parts of your body to stimulate muscle growth. And if we can't move half your body, half muscle growth is gone. It's a big problem. Let's do maintenance. Let's do a good job of healing that injury. Once you come back, ease in. When you're at full strength or close, then we can start our sort of full mobility um, and without pain. Then we can start to go and gain mass. Um, I know it's crazy to have to mention that, but people try this stuff all the time. All right, last part, myths and misconceptions in muscle gain. There are so many, we couldn't possibly have included all, but we included like 10 or so. Let's let's get uh, let's get to these and sort of just a real basics of why they're a bad idea. Trying to stay infinity lean, lean all year round. I just want to see my crisp abs and veins. I want to be 7% at all times. Well, thing is, if you stay lean all the time, you are essentially saying to yourself, I'm not allowing myself to gain much or pretty much any fat. Most productive muscle gains in males occur between 10 and 20% fat, and in females between, oh, if we're being generous, 15 to 25%, but really it's more like 17 to 30% fat. Uh, if you have a female who won't go above 16% fat, she's almost sort of by rule definition not allowing herself to gain muscle. It's like wanting to be a marathon runner, but telling yourself you never run any longer than two miles. Um, there's not really a way to run those two miles that hard that you'll get ready for a marathon. You can get somewhere, but you're sure as hell won't get marathon distance. It's trying to stay infinity lean, 
It's just a really, really short-sighted way of doing it. 99 times out of 100, it comes from some kind of body dysmorphia where the folks are just so addicted to being lean, so scared of gaining any fat because they think it's permanent or they just hate it, that they won't let themselves get a calculated level of body fat increase. It's just really fucking sad when that happens. Don't let it happen. Don't stay infinity lean. Gain a measured, known, predictable, planned amount of body fat be okay with it for the short term. You can always get lean later and reveal the muscle underneath. It's a two steps, you know, three steps forward, one step back situation. Or in the case of body fat, it's a two steps back, three steps forward situation. A lot of people just don't take any steps back. They'll never take those steps forward. Here's another one. Trying to mask for too short a time, which nine times out of 10 is for the same reason as being infinity lean. Uh, this happens with female uh, clients a lot of times. Uh, well, they'll say, okay, I want to mass gain for three weeks. And that, that's it. They're like, three weeks is not going to accomplish anything, right? Um, as we talked before, that's below our, our shortest duration, really. And uh, nine times out of 10, it's because they're like, well, I'll just get fat if I mass for longer. The easiest solution to that is what they think is as massing uh, it, or muscle gaining is is like, uh, you know, at least like a percent of body weight increase per week. But that's just the crazy high. It's too high. You know, if they say, OK, there's no way that you're going to get me to mass for 12 weeks. You say, OK, how about we gain like six pounds over the course of of those 12 weeks. And they're going to be like, well, that's not that much. I thought we we're going to gain 10 pounds in three weeks. It's like, no, oh my God, no. And when you like, you say, okay, when six is too much. Well, let's gain four pounds in 12 weeks. They're like, all right, but if I get too fat, I'm cutting it off. You're like, deal, right? And they gain for 10 weeks and they still feel great. And they're like, ah, let's keep going and all is well, right? So don't let people mask for too short of a time. The easiest way you can explain it is like, look, we're literally, you know, we're just doing essentially the, uh, a foundational hypertrophy, uh, and we're not even getting real muscle gains, we're just preparatory growth. It's like inflating a tire and then pulling the pump out to let out just as much air as you let back in. Like, like if you're going to put the pump in, you got to pump it a couple more times extra so that when the air comes out at the back end, there's just, you know, you still have a net hypertrophy. And within three or four weeks of mass gaining, that's really not going to happen. Right. Uh, another myth and misconceptions. And this is one that's not really so much of a myth or misconception. It's just a shitty practice we have to talk about. A lack of consistent nutrition basics. I used to coach high school football players and uh, help them with muscle gain. And they would brag to me about how big a meal was that they ate. And I was like, sweet, what'd you eat the rest of the day? And they're like, not much. And I'm like, well, that's why you're not gaining weight. What'd you eat yesterday? And they're like, I don't know, it was a real bad day. Who cares? If you can't consistently get enough calories and protein, especially, you're fucking done you're done. So a lot of times people will say like, man, I had really two, you know, uh, this is something you'll see out of uh, same the same Wall Street clients, right? They'll say, man, I had a great Monday through Friday. I'm like, okay, how was your weekend? They're like, went to the club and I didn't eat for, must have been 36 hours. I just danced. And they're like, well, did you have fun? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, well, Did you gain any weight last week? No. All right. And that's kind of like the saddest situation of all. Not dancing for 36 hours at a club. There's nothing sad about that. What's sad isn't the people that never put in any effort and also always do a mediocre effort and then get mediocre or no results. It kind of like, you know, makes sense. What's really awful is the people that are on the money like three, four, five, six days out of the week. And then one, two, or three days out of the week, they're so bad, they're so off the rocker that it cancels out everything. Like, it's possible to just demonstrate with mathematical deficits. Like, if you overeat intentionally by two or 300 calories every day, you're on a great track. If you have one day on the weekend where you undereat by 1,500 calories, which people do all the fucking time, just disappear somewhere, um, they just canceled out all that stuff potentially. Like, that's fucking awful, right? So lack of consistent nutrition basics is something that is a non-starter, right? If someone is bad with consistency and nutritional basics, and by that we mean calories, macros, and just generally decent number of healthy food meals, if they're not doing that, man, that's what you got to put all your attention to as a coach. And if you're not doing that, you better start doing it because you get nowhere without consistency, right? Gaining too slow, uh, people get freaked out again about gaining fat. So they're like, I'm going to gain... 0.1% of body weight per month. And then in 2045, when robots are taking over, I'll finally have gained five pounds of muscle or some shit. Don't go crazy. Stick with that range. 0.25 to 0.5%. You'll be golden, right? 
gaining too fast and getting too fat. I've done that numerous times. I've probably done that maybe 10 or 12 times. Uh, and it, it sh it's shitty every time, <laughs> right? You just get super fat, super unhealthy for no good reason. And you have to work your ass off getting rid of the fat. It's dumb. Don't do it. Um, there's no rainbow at the end of, of, of that, uh, or sorry, there's no there's no uh, pot of gold at the end of, of that rainbow because you think, man, but at least I'm going to gain a ton of muscle, and you gain like like just a couple of percent more muscle than you would have if you just moderately increased your body weight over time. So that's really uh, fruitless. Inappropriate training stimulus. A really good example is people on powerlifting programs doing sets of two and three trying to gain mass. Uh, it's just not going to cut it. Uh, we had a, a question at one seminar that I did, it was um, uh, this person wanted to know if they could gain muscle mass while running a physique training program and at the same time training for a marathon. And we were all just like, no, <laughs> that is a real bad idea. Why? Because how are you going to gain muscle in your legs if you use your legs in the complete opposite pathway of muscle gain? Well, it's going to be a real uphill battle, probably just all for naught. So what's the solution there? Never gain muscle or never train for a marathon? No, you're just doing both at separate times. Take six months, baseline endurance capability just to keep yourself in decent shape, tons of weight training, gain muscle. Once you've gained the muscle, maintain it a little bit, and then decrease your weight training, increase your cardio, do your marathon training. You'll probably keep a great majority of that muscle, and then you can restart the process. But trying them both at the same time is a real bad idea. It's, uh, you know, the ultimate sort of incompatibility of, of nutritional and training uh, modalities. A, a really good analogy for that is, you know, how do you get the most work done and make the most money at your job? You show up on time, you do diligent, hard work, you focus, you take breaks when you need them, but you boom, boom, you're on task. And then how do you, how do you become the most relaxed and reduce the most stress? Well, you know, you really unplug, you know, cabin in the woods with all your friends, like free spirits and all that shit, staring out into the sky, running around in circles, springing daisies on yourself. Um, that's great. That's the best way to just relax and let go. Just, you know, throw the cell phone away, that whole deal. Um, what's the best way to do both at the same time? There is no good way to put it. Like, you know, one is completely incompatible with the other. Like, how are you going to run around in the meadows uh, finding your inner child when you got things to questions to answer on a laptop or, you know, charts and graphs to make? It's just, it's just incompatible. You just do one, do it well, finish it, submit it, go on and sprinkle daisies on yourself in the meadow. Same way with appropriate training stimuli. If you got some other things going on, you want to do endurance work, you want to do this, you want to do that, powerlifting, get it done, do it, accomplish your results, and then dedicate yourself to the right kind of training during a muscle gain phase, which is high volume hypertrophy training, not up for debate. Um, uh, another one is alternating between goals. Uh, in the middle of the goal, people will start to gain weight and they'll be like, oh, I'm cutting now and they'll cut and then they'll gain and they'll cut and they'll gain. And it sends really mixed signals to your physiology and the physiology just throws up two middle fingers and tells you it's not doing shit. Um, I know a lot of people who sort of don't know if they're massing or cutting and it changes week to week. And I know a lot of those people who just don't go anywhere because the you can think about it this way. If they're massing, cutting, massing, cutting, massing, cutting, usually their weight just stays right about the same. It is like they're maintaining except with double the stress, right? So Pick which way you want to go, go that way for months, accomplish what you need to accomplish, and then go the other way. It's almost like running around the meadow, sprinkling some flowers on yourself, sitting down, answering a couple of emails, and running around the meadow again. It's just, again, real real bad for both. Because, again, a lot of times the transitional phases is what you end up doing uh, more than anything else. It's just one is just recalibrating for the other. As soon as you've recalibrated and you really start to gain muscle, you start cutting. As soon as you really start to gain some, lose some fat instead of just glycogen, you start massing. And it just, it just goes nowhere. Right. Um, super, super related is people who plan this in advance and try to mass and cut in the same week. This is like, you know, when you learn six months of physiology and you fucking have an Einsteinian moment and you're like, okay, if I gain for four days of the week, but I lose for three days of the week, lean gains, bro. <laughs> That's it. If I do that for 10 years, I'm going to be fucking jacked and never get fat. Well, the thing is, again, there are systems in the body that take days and weeks to ramp up. Muscle growth doesn't just occur uh, because of the day that you ate something. It occurs the second day, third day as well. So, for example, whatever body part you train on day four, if the next three days are fat loss, whatever body part you train pretty much day three and day four, they're not going to grow much because the protein you're supposed to be supplying to their FSR curves is, is going to be eaten up by your body processes and is not even going to be enough carbohydrates to stimulate anabolism optimally and not enough calories to, to get the muscle growth done. So basically like, you know, if you train legs on Monday and you train arms on Thursday, your arms are just not going to gain much size because you diet for the rest of the three days after. 
And then actually, because you're so depleted after those three days, when you hit your leg workout, yeah, your recovery from legs is going to be good because you're eating for the next four days, but your initial workout could suck because you're too glycogen depleted and too fatigued. It's kind of the worst of all worlds. Again, mixing modalities is real, real perilous. Just focus on one general thing at a time. Let it run its course, cut it when it needs to be cut, and then go to another one. Secret of life success. Right now, the slide I'm looking at is pure darkness. It says end of slideshow, click to exit, much like life itself. Folks, that is not a reason for concern because there's always more RPU and RP Plus videos coming your way. I will see you next time for tons of them. Peace.